In April of 2020, the Northern Hemisphere experienced its second largest two-month drop in temperature in the 497-month satellite record. This means that NOAA's satellites recorded the second largest two-month temperature drop in history. Now, the version 6.0 global average lower tropospheric temperature, the LT anomaly, for April 2020 was positive 3.8 degrees, down from March 2020 value of positive 4.8. The Northern Hemisphere temperature anomaly fell from plus 9.6 degrees down to plus 0.43 degrees from February to April in the same time. This is the second largest two-month drop in the 497-month satellite record. The largest two-month drop was 0.69 degrees C back in 1987, right here. Additionally, the temperature in 1987 before the drop is exactly the same as right now during global warming. Decades later. That should make you wonder. Now, the linear warming trend since 1979 all but remains statistically unchanged based on this data. Now, let's break it down. And I will leave you links to all of this data set where you can see all of the data from 1978 to present. That will be included below so you can make your own graphs. Become your own advocate. Now. Let's talk about some notes on the data that was just released. The second largest temperature drop in recorded history over the last two months. And you're looking at the April 2020 lower troposphere and the temperature anomaly recorded. The seasonally adjusted temperatures dropped a bit in the tropics and northern hemisphere from March values, leading to a global temperature departure of point positive. 0.38 C. We showed you that just moments ago. As indicated last month, we suggested that the drop is due to part of the cooling of the central Pacific Ocean. And this whole air region is quite cool in the entire southern oceans. Blue, 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 quite cool. So recall that in the later months of 2019, a weak, warm El Nino like event occurred, which aided in warming up the atmosphere for a few months but that impact was mostly exhausted. And if we just go back to the data set, you can see the warming is these spikes. This was that El Nino, and it also there were some other additive effects in there. So the two month drop in the Northern Hemisphere temperature of minus 0.53 C is extremely rare. Exceeded only once in the 497 month history. When the Northern Hemisphere cooled, between the 1987 warm El Nino and the cold 89 La Nina, and that dropped 0.69 degrees C between December of 87 and February of 88. Now, the region with the warmest departure from average, which is the large hot spot over here over Russia, this orange spot, it's in the Kransyarsk Krai region, and the peak occurred near Vorogovo at a remarkable plus 6.4 degrees C, right here in the center of the orange. As usual, when it's very warm in one place, there are usually a series of alternating cold and warm regions in the same latitude belt. And let's take a look. Orange, blue, orange, blue, orange, averaging out to normal. See how that works? Now, this month, the pattern indicates three warm peaks. Central Russia, here. The Gulf of Alaska, here. And Europe, which is in the middle. With three cool areas in between. The Sea of Japan, Canada, and Western Russia. Moving eastward from the peak in Central Russia to the cool area in Central Canada, from here to here. We find the coldest departure from average near Prince Albert National Park in Saskatchewan, somewhere right in this region, with a 3.3 degree C or 6 degree Fahrenheit anomaly in the negative. 
Now, besides the locations I just mentioned, warmer than average conditions prevailed in the Caribbean, eastern Antarctica, and western Australia. Where is that? Yeah, right there. So there, you, what you should glean from what I'm telling you is that there are cold spots and there are hot spots. And cooler than average temperatures were found in the entire Southern Oceans. One, two, three, four. Those are all the ocean spots. The coterminous U.S. itself, which is devoid of Alaska and Hawaii, experienced its coldest April since 1998, being minus 0.59 degrees C below the seasonal average. In April in the U.S. has a huge range can go from positive two degrees to as low as where we are. So there's that. But the remarkable warmth of the lower stratosphere that was linked to the aerosols of Pinatubo causing this spike here. Where are we? Yeah, so this was the Pinatubo eruption causing the cooling and then a warming due to the residual aerosols. So this warming occurred because of a volcanic eruption, and we're experiencing the same warming here in a similar way. April's temperature was the warmest since the volcanically induced warming in 1993, and so that is going to be a major warming right in this realm here. So what, what do we, now we just broke down the last few months of data. I mean, it's all over our face. And I tried to point out some of the pictures on the map and how, and one thing to warn about here, there's the April cooling up here in the northeast of the U.S. This is going to continue through May and maybe even into June. We're going to see some extreme frosts here up in Michigan in the northeast. And we could have some record-breaking weather forming as we enter summer here, which could be a bummer. And if there's a volcanic eruption, it's all bets are off for growing food in the Northeast this year. But without the volcanic eruption, all things should be normal except for a few perturbations. And what? why do we have these perturbations? It has nothing to do with you and CO2 and uh, fossil fuels and all that nonsense. There are natural climate cycles. And now this is coming from the U.S. Forest Service the Climate Change Resource Center. So all of these repositories of information, which have good information, have to include global warming, which makes them less good. The beauty is here that they talk about all the facts and they don't mention global warming until the end here. <laughs> so that's good. So if you want to learn about natural climate cycles, which is my life study, you can learn about the millennial cycles, including the Milankovitch cycles, which uh, my graduate work included work on the precessional cycle, obliquity and eccentricity, major glacial cycles, and interglacials. So those are the millennial climate cycles. There's also century scale climate cycles, which we talk about uh, in grand solar minimums and bond cycles. In addition to the multi-millennial glacial and interglacials, there are shorter, colder, warm cycles that occur on 200 to 1500 year scales. The 200 year scale would be the grand minima, the thousand-year scale is the bond cycle. And the mechanisms that cause these cycles and many other cycles are not completely understood. But they're thought to be driven by changes in the sun. Can you imagine that? The sun is what warms us up when it rises and it what cools us down when it sets. It's not you, folks. It's not CO2. It's the sun. And I don't know how many times I could say that before I, well. Then there's the interannual to decadal climate cycles. This is the ENSO cycles, El Nino, La Nina, and Neutral. And the ENSO events occur every three to seven years and bring different weather conditions to different parts of the world. Couple that with the, the AMO, the PDO, which is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillations, and you have a recipe. Yes, you do, for natural climate cycles, which is natural climate variability. I'm going to leave you links to this paper on natural climate variability by Michael Gill, where he goes over everything in great detail. This was published back in 2002, and you get the seven-page paper. I think you'll get through it. 
And most importantly, you should check out the spectral analysis they did here, the composite spectrum of climate variability from all proxy data. And you could see the spike. There's a daily spike in temperature and climate. Wow, <laughs> who would have guessed? There's a monthly cycle. There's a yearly cycle. There's a 2.5, a 10 to 20 year, a 25 to 35, a 100 to 400 year cycle, a 2 to 2.5 kilo year, a 6 to 7 kilo year, a 20 kilo year, a 40 kilo year. So this is the precession, the obliquity, the eccentricity, and the super eccentricity cycle or the major glacial cycle, the 400 kilo year cycle. So there in a nutshell, in under 15 minutes, you are an expert on natural climate variability. We showed you the data. The mainstream is not going to tell you that we had the largest temperature drop in history. And if they do, they'll say it's because of the coronavirus lockdown and you saved the planet. But the sun defines the climate. And here we come over to a good friend of mine, Habibulo Abdusmatov, and his work on grand minimas. And you can see hot sun and cool sun. And the cool sun is in red, of all things. And we just came off of cycle 24, which is very similar to cycle 7 back in the Dalton minimum. We're entering cycle 25, which would be synonymous with cycle 6, which is the bottom of the Dalton. And we'll see where we go. But you can see definitely here a large cold period here in the 1700s, another cold period here in the 1900s, a cold period in the 1800s. And we're going to have a cold period in the 2000s on that 200 year cycle. The load back here, 1600, 1800, 2000. And you can see from 1800 to 1830 or more was cold. So we're probably talking 2030 to get really cold. That's my official report. And to follow up to date, non biased climate science. Check out nsstc.auah. This is the University of Alabama Huntsville Global Temperature Report website. I'll link it below, Earth System Science Center. It's where I got the map that we talked about earlier that we went over in great detail, where Siberia is up six degrees and Saskatchewan is down three. That is natural climate variability. Come check out the monthly global troposphere. Check out the largest drop in two months ever right here. Amazing. And stay informed, but most importantly, don't believe the hype. It's a sequel. Hope you got something out of the video. That's the sound of someone's head coming out of there. Please share this with like minded people. Global warming happens, and it's followed by global cooling in an annual, <laughs> biannual, decadal, multi decadal, millennial scale. We call it natural climate variability. We also call it science. Anything else? Well, you can flush it down the dogma chute. Be safe. We love you.